you could turn to Exodus chapter 24, verses 12 to 18. And I notice some of you actually have Bibles that you are turning to. Others of you are turning on your phones. Um, the church that Betty used to be a part of. Sometime in the next couple of weeks, Betty is going to be ordained as a deacon. She is now part of us. But at that church, it was uh, announced, probably printed in the bulletin, that if your phone goes off during the service, you have to treat the congregation to pizza. <laughs> so um, I think I've shared that with you before. And we've had a couple of those occasions. I like mine white with pepperoni. <laughs> so when you order, please order one of those. Uh, we were out to dinner uh, last night. Uh, Dee was with us. and. Uh, we were with uh, actually children of friends and grandchildren of friends and uh, in Dee's case, cousins of son's wife and uh, former uh, colleague employer's children and all kinds of stories going on. And of course, in the midst of all of that, I was the minister. Um, I was kind of, I was the hanger on. Bill and I had that distinction uh, quite often. Uh, and um, as uh, it was time to leave, uh, what often occurs is, uh, you know, we ought to close in prayer. And of course, everybody turns and looks at the uh, uh, minister. And I shared with them that in my quiet time, I've been reading along with uh, some of uh, Eugene Peterson's writing in addition to the devotional that I'm using. And uh, in those writings, which are excerpts from old church newsletters and other things that he wrote throughout his ministry, um, he is doing a little section on prayer. And one of the things he says as a clergy person, he says, one of the things I really hate as a pastor is when people turn to me and say, could you say a little prayer for us? And uh, he goes on to rant a little bit, not too long. And some of you have read Eugene Peterson, so you know he is really a very gentle writer. And uh, even when he's harsh, he's gentle. And uh, he says, no prayer is a little prayer. Uh, so I kind of shared that with the group. and. Uh, our host, uh, who we all remember when he was a little boy, uh, and we had shared a few of those stories, he said, I'm perfectly happy to pray. I said, no, 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 that's OK. I'm the professional. My sons always say, Dad, you pray. It's your job. And, uh, and we did have a very uh, special time of prayer together. But uh, prior to that, they asked me, which often haps, happens to me when I'm with people on a Saturday night. What are you preaching on tomorrow? Sometimes people look at me like, have you prepared your sermon yet? And um, I smiled and I said, uh, do you know what tomorrow is? And uh, D, who uh, you know gets all age, you know, D is still getting all age. You should be aware of that. Uh, Dee knew the answer. Uh, she didn't say it, but she just kind of nodded her head. And she said, I, I know what it is. And uh, I smiled at the rest of them. And I said, tomorrow is, is the day of transfiguration. Um, and of course, we always know that that's the signal that Lent is about to begin with Ash Wednesday this coming Wednesday. And, uh, and our host said, uh, he said, you know, we, we recently were a part of a Bible study, and he pulled out the book and showed it to me. He said, have you seen this? And uh, I saw the author's name, and I said, I'm familiar with that author. And uh, he said, uh, it, it has been so exciting for me to kind of plug into and become aware of the Christian year. And I responded and said, uh, that's why I continue to preach the lectionary. Because it gives me the opportunity and a congregation the opportunity 
every year to re-experience the gospel as we go through the church year together. And we should be aware that as we get ready to begin this season of Lent, we're going to Jerusalem again for the last time. We're beginning that walk, and uh, you'll see that our sermon series, we're taking the text this year from the gospel uh, accounts in the lectionary, uh, and at each step along the way, we're going to run into circumstances and people who have questions. Every Sunday during Lent is going to be about questions, beginning next Sunday with devilish questions. It'll be a special time. I've preached this sermon series before, and every time this lectionary year comes up, I kind of rub my hands. I was sharing with my pastor friends, we get together once a month. Uh, I was with Nancy and uh, Connie's old pastor. He's going to be 90 this year, and uh, he sat next to me at lunch. He was Judy and Jack's uh, pastor as well at one time, but uh, this gang of us get together. It was about two or three months uh, uh, ago. I, I said to everybody, have you looked at the text for Lent this year? I said, I, I can't wait. My favorite gospel texts for Lent are coming up. I, I can't wait for them. Um, and for me, it's another opportunity, along with all of us, to kind of walk along with Jesus. And um, each year we have the opportunity to do that. Um, you know, we'll celebrate the resurrection and then we'll go through that period that anticipates the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And then we have that long, what the, the calendar folks call ordinary time the Sundays after Pentecost that go all the way up to the time when we celebrate the, the Christ the King Sunday. And then what comes right after that is the beginning again with the Advent preparation for the celebration of his birth. I, it never gets old for me. And so my young friend, who's not so young anymore. Isn't it frightening, folks, when we realize that our young friends are old? You know, I mean, it, it, here's a guy who still has one kid left who hasn't graduated from college, who's still younger, you know, the surprise kid that comes at the end. Uh, they still have that kid, but, uh, and, and uh, I'm telling him stories about when I used to pick him up at kindergarten when his mother was sick, and, um, uh, boy, our life cycle just goes on. And he, he's sharing with me, he says, you know, recently we've discovered the Christian year. And oh, it's added a richness to our lives. And today is the transfiguration. And the Old Testament text, which is the type for what is going to happen when Jesus goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John is when Moses gets called up to Mount Sinai or what you will see in uh, later narratives in the scripture will be referred to as Mount Horeb. We usually think of it as Mount Sinai and that's the way it's described at this point. They are only a couple of months removed from Egypt. And before we come to chapter 24, Moses has already been called up and down that mountain several times. There was no chairlift to take him up. So you imagine, he is in the second trimester of his life. He led uh, three 40-year trimesters, and if Nathan was with us this morning, you go home and tell Nathan this, that he got mentioned uh, because he asked the question in confirmation class, uh, is there something special about the number 40? 
And we talked a little bit about numbers in the uh, Bible, uh, and, and one of the things we told them is that uh, Moses' life is broken down into three sections of 40. He's in that middle section, uh, or excuse me, he's actually in the third section at this point. Uh, and um, he's going up and down that mountain. Are any of you ready for a mountain climb after worship this morning? Because it seems that Moses was always ready to go up and down that mountain. So here the Lord says for the umpteenth time in chapter 24, the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here. And I'll give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. He, he's already given Moses a whole lot of stuff to write down. And it's during this discourse and this part of uh, the Exodus that uh, there is mention made of the fact that at one point when my, uh, Moses comes down the mountain, he spends some time and he writes it all down in the book of life. The scriptures are being composed as we read this. Moses is writing it down. Very unique at that particular time in history. One of the things that was unique about the Israelite people. At one point, he says to Joshua, write it in the book. The word of God was precious. So he sets out with Joshua, his aide, and he went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and her are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. Aaron, of course, is the high priest, the brother uh, of Moses, and, and at this point, they haven't received all the detailed instructions yet for the tabernacle. They will, or what Aaron's ultimate role will be. And it's very fascinating, given the fact that, as we're going to see, and all of you know, Aaron completely flops at this point as a leader. And he's supposed to be Moses' mouthpiece. Because remember what Moses said at the burning bush? How many of you have ever said this when you've been asked to share something from the pulpit? I don't speak too well. That's what Moses said. And of course, the Lord anticipating that response said, don't worry, your brother will speak for you. And of course, some of us who were the youngest are thinking, my brother spoke for me all my life. And Aaron is his older brother. That was probably not unusual for him, but Moses is now the leader, the prophet of the people. And it's become clear that he is quite a prophet. So he tells the elders that his father-in-law encouraged him to rely on and give responsibility to to hang in there, I'll be back, Aaron and Hur will lead you. Hur is kind of a mysterious character, and the name appears quite often of several characters at this point in the uh, narrative, uh, but uh, he, he was an intimate of Moses and Aaron, apparently, and was often given responsibility. He's not a brother. Uh, but he was given leadership responsibility. He was probably one of the elders. Uh, they can handle any disputes that come up. If someone wants to complain about someone ripping a hole in their tent, take it to them. So Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. And if you read what leads up to this, this is constantly being witnessed by all of the Israelites as Moses is making these trips up and down the mountain. And in the beginning, the Lord says, I'm going to come to you on the mountain. Don't let anyone near even the base of the mountain. If they go near the base of the mountain, they will immediately die. This is holy ground. 
And of course, when the Lord comes down, the, the, the mountain trembles and there's fire and the fire produces smoke. I mean, this is wild, folks. And please remember that they're only in their second or third month in, in the wilderness. The, these same people had just crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. And then they had turned around to see the Egyptian army, which had enslaved them for all those years, be buried under that water with all of their powerful chariots and horses and might. Just as Moses raised his staff and the Lord separated the sea. And prior to that, they saw frogs all over the place. And the Nile River turned to blood. Plague after plague after plague upon the Egyptians. As Moses told them to hang in there, God was going to free them from this slavery. And they saw all this happen to the Egyptians, but not to them. And they were told. Get the best lambs from the flock, one for each family. Do you know how many Hebrew families there were? The scriptures tell us. 650,000 adult males in the Hebrew nation. One perfect unblemished lamb for each family. And the Lord can see that if you have a small family. Now we have to realize the Lord had made them fruitful to multiply. They were reproducing like gerbils. There were not many small families. So conservative estimate, 400,000 possibly unblemished lambs which would have substantially devalued the flocks of Egypt. And the only thing the Hebrew slaves were in charge of was the sheep industry, which was beneath the Egyptians, but one of their most valuable economic resources. It was the only power wedge the slaves had. And basically God said, destroy it. Take these little lambs in your house, make them like the family pet for a couple of days. Can't you all see it? The little lamb running around your living room and say, oh, isn't he cute? You know, and your neighbors come over and they say, oh, he's almost as cute as ours and you want to see ours. He's got a little black spot right on his nose and so forth and so on. And then the Lord says, kill it. with specific instructions. And on this certain night, you are to take the blood of that sacrifice and sprinkle it on the door frame. Get permission from the building committee first. <laughs> Go to the clerk of session, she'll clear it for you. And if you have a hot date, you better not go out that night. Stay in the house. Don't sneak out. Because the angel of death will come over all of the homes in Egypt. This will be the last of the plagues. It will be the plague of the eldest. And all of those homes that are not covered by the blood of the lamb, the eldest in that home will die along with the eldest of the livestock, if there were any left, because they had had several plagues that involved frogs and livestock and this and that and every other thing. This is like Sunday school, isn't it? This is not a story, folks. 
This is what these people had witnessed in the recent events of their lives. And we continue all these years later to bear witness to these events because just as the angel of death passed over their homes, the angel of death once and for all has passed over our lives because of the sacrifice of the unblemished lamb, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Have we forgotten how special that is? Have we forgotten that as we gather together to worship this morning that the promise is there? Wherever you gather in my name, I am there with you in the midst of you. And we read this and we think, boy, how could they not be faithful? How could they be sitting around thinking about the cheap hoagie they're going to get after worship? Instead of just being in awe of all this. I mean, just that first trip up the mountain, which, by the way, was preceded by the bad water. <laughs> Remember? And the, and the Lord had Moses throw the stick in the water, and all of a sudden it was good. That would have been enough for most of us. And see, we have more reason to be in awe than any generation in the history of the world. Isn't that interesting? Because we know all of this, plus all of church history, plus what's being added to church history right now. It was part of our prayer time this morning. Steve was praying about our history. From a farmhouse to a barn to a building. How soon we forget. Same God. So he went up and the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord settled on it. And six days the cloud covered the mountain. And on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on, on up the mountain. He left Joshua behind. And he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. How long does it take you? I confess, sometimes it doesn't even take 40 minutes for me to begin thinking and living like 40 minutes before I didn't have a precious time alone with the Lord or a majestic time alone with the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Quite a word, isn't it? Thanks be to God. Let us pray silently. And some of you are thinking you have more to say. Yes, but I'll go quickly. Let us pray silently for the proclamation of God's word for all of us today. Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. You who are our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, you all know what happens. They get bored and fearful. 
and rebellious. And Aaron, who will serve faithfully, substantially as high priest in the future, he just doesn't have the calling to lead these people. Little brother Moses, who God has called to be the prophet, is up on that mountain for over a month, 40 days. The people get restless. They're out in the wilderness in a land that is not one that's familiar to them. And some of us have been in that wilderness today. It's not much better. It's, it's, it's arid out there in certain seasons of the year. I wasn't there during one of those seasons. Apparently, when the rainy season occurs, some wildflowers spring up and it gets a little bit of color. But let me tell you, it's hot. And they have livestock as well as their own three million people or two and a half million, whatever it came out to. It, it's like a small city out there. And Moses is the one with the magic staff in their eyes. He's the one through whom God, up until this point, has created these signs and miracles. And he's up on that mountain. And remember, he went into the cloud. The cloud is still on that mountain. Got to keep your eyes on the Lord to remember that he's with us. But they begin to get fond of their morbid past, those days leading up to the Super Bowl. They want to put on their old green jerseys again. And of all things, they say to Aaron, you know, give us a gold calf to worship. And they pressure him and pressure him and pressure him. He, he, he just doesn't have the guts to keep staving them down. And so he said, okay, take all your gold jewelry that you have on and, and take it off and throw it in the pot here and we'll melt it down. And uh, he takes a little bit of it and he molds a little gold calf. One of the many gods that they had in Egypt. Remember, one of the plagues was the livestock. Every one of those plagues was a god that the Egyptian people worshipped. The final one being the Pharaoh's son who would become the next god because they believed Pharaoh was a god. So the son of Pharaoh, the eldest, would become the next god. Let's go back to Egyptian idol worship. Because what, what's, what's our God? He only separates seas and uh, purifies water and creates water out of nothing and you know cares for us in this way. And that was so they build the calf. And the Lord reveals to Moses on the mountain after those 40 days and 40 nights of receiving all kinds of law that he has to communicate to the people as well as all the instructions for building the tabernacle for worship. He's coming down the mountain and, and in addition to having all of that probably imprinted on his brain at this point, as he's coming down, he's got the slates of the law that God himself has written on and given to him. So he's Carrying those down. Guy must have had an unbelievable pair of legs to go up and down that mountain. And as he comes out of the top part where he meets alone with the Lord, uh, he picks up his aide-de-camp, Joshua. Well, as it turns out, little timid, not a good speaker, Moses has a confrontation with the Lord. Because the Lord says, I want you to know, the people are partying down there. 
They're worshiping an idol. And basically, they're having an orgy. And I'm done, the Lord says. I've had it. I'm going to destroy them and start all over with you. You could probably do a comedy routine of Moses responding to the Lord. <clears throat> I don't know what the nature of his speech problem was, but uh, you could probably have some fun with that if you just wanted to turn it into a comedy routine. But suddenly, reluctant Moses, and you read about this in our silent preparation, he really takes on his role just naturally, and of course God's not surprised by this, God has equipped him for this, he becomes the mediator for the people. He says, Lord, you cannot do that. What will the Egyptians, and of course in his mind, that's the world that is most important, what will they think if they see that your people have lost faith in you? For your sake, we have to preserve them as a people. The Lord's ready to start a whole, you remember with Adam? Remember with Noah? He's ready to start a whole new deal. And it says the Lord relents. Now, folks, we're a Reformed church. We know that God is sovereign. <laughs> God knows what he's up to. There will be consequences. All those thousands of years later, there's Peter, James, and John, and right after Peter gets in trouble with Jesus, and Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Ten days later, he says, uh, Peter, James, John, come up the mountain with me. And on that mountain, same thing that happened to Moses happens with them. Cloud descends on the mountain, <laughs> and there are three glorified people with them on the mountain, one of whom is Jesus, but a different Jesus. He's temporarily glorified, and with him are Moses and Elijah. And we have to assume that they were introduced and had conversation together because, you know, they didn't have portraits of Moses and Elijah. They didn't say, oh, I saw your picture. You do look like Charlton Heston. No, they, they, didn't, they didn't just suddenly conclude that. And they were having a wonderful time, probably ecstatically wonderful because the truth is, is they really couldn't communicate in words what it was like. For those of you who have lost special people in your lives, they may be enjoying that right now. They're at least getting a taste of it. The full enjoyment may come when he comes again and we are all lifted up to the heavenly kingdom. Have you forgotten that hope? When we began the confirmation class, I promise this is the end of it, we gave Nate and Lucas a piece of paper with what looked like a sideways T on it or whatever. It was really a blank timeline. And we told them at the end of this thing, you're going to have to write a statement of faith and it'll have two parts. The first part will be about what the Christian faith is. But the second part of it is, so what? What do you believe about this? And as we told them this past week, 
The devil knows more about the Christian faith than we do. He believes more about all the details than we do. But he doesn't believe in it. So we told them, beginning with that first week, you know, each week when you're bored with your homework or whatever, put a mark somewhere along the line on that timeline when you can recall having a sense that God was doing something in your life. One week we were asking him how it was coming along and Lucas said something and, and we said, well, where did you get that idea? And, and uh, Miss Jill, <laughs> I remember Miss Jill telling us about that. And of course, that went right over my head. She's one of my neighbors, but I forgot all that. I said, Miss Jill, and then D reminded me it was Jill. <laughs> and something else came up, and it was Miss Jill. Again, those of you who have spent your hours wondering why the preacher was going so long, when are we, when's he going to let us get out of here? Um, the impact is great that we have on each other's lives. I'm almost tempted to forego my hoagie and make you all stay and fill out a timeline. <laughs> Wednesday evening, we're going to have a preacher from the pew, and part of what the preacher from the pew will have to do is share with us a bit about that person's relationship with Christ, how it began and how it's going. And then what the cross of Christ means to that person. What if we ask you to be the preacher from the pew on Ash Wednesday? When's the last time you have experienced again the wonder of the glory of God invading your life. Because you know we fall into just going through the motions. And worshiping our golden calves. Maybe not as drastically as the Israelites did. And maybe sometimes just as drastic. Don't let us lose it, folks. Don't ever think it's corny every once in a while to put your hand on the shoulder of your friend and say, I'm so grateful for you. I'll never forget how the Lord taught me this through you. And those poor three guys, they were having such a great time. <laughs> they didn't even want to go get the hoagie. They just wanted to stay up there, and they began babbling. One gospel tells us, literally, that Peter was babbling. Uh, and one gospel tells us, he said to the other guy, let's build shelters up here and stay forever. This is so great, isn't it? And they heard that voice. Oh, wow. The cloud comes upon them. This is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And then the cloud lifts, and Jesus looks normal again, and the other guys aren't even there, Moses and Elijah, and they start the long trek down the mountain. We believe it's probably Mount Hermon. And as they're going down, Jesus says, Oh, by the way, guys, you are not to tell anyone. 
The only new word they heard from the cloud, it was the same as that Jesus' baptism, if any of them were around to hear it at his baptism, he said the same words, but he added one sentence, listen to him. And the first major thing Jesus says is, don't tell anyone until after the resurrection. And of course, at that point, they're talking to each other and they're saying, resurrection, what's a resurrection? Jesus is probably out ahead of them smirking and rolling his eyes, thinking, oh boy, if they only knew what they were in for. How about you? Can you only think that it's already quarter after? Or have you been refreshed this morning with a new awareness that we have to remember and experience every day the wonderful gift of the presence of Christ in our lives? Don't ever take it for granted. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord that you really have come to us. And through your Holy Spirit, you remain with us and in us, not only leading us and covering us, but also interceding for us each moment. We pray that that would never get old for us, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name.